Welcome back to Geek Channel 8. I'm Eric. And I'm Rosie. Today on the podcast, we're going to be doing Dracula, Pages from a Virgin's Diary, <laughs> which by the title you might think is a B movie, but it is in fact more cultured than that. We got a massive snow dump last night and the day before, and we're supposed to get more tonight, I think. So it's at least up to my knees. And the problem is that my house and my neighbor's house are right next to each other. So our plow guy, I'll give them this bit. Our plow guy came through and plowed a single stripe that allows the driveway at its narrowest point, one car to get in and out. The problem is, of course, that there are three of us and the other two cars are completely blocked in. I'm parked in the garage, which I pay an exorbitant amount for a, a garage space. It's like double what you'd think a garage space would cost. Oh, man. But I can't get out of the garage. The neighbor's house, there are certain residents that live by the back door and they have like a tiny little walkway that goes to a door and that got covered by snow from our plow guy, you know, so they have to shovel out. But I don't feel that bad for them because it's about, I don't know, 12 feet. <laughs> Whereas their plow guy comes through and pushes all the snow onto our land after our plow guys already come, right? So thus defeating the purpose. And I saw them doing that and my car wasn't where they were plowing, but my upstairs neighbors was. So I ran out and stopped them because I could see the snow falling in front of her car, making it going to be even harder for her to dig out. Right, right. While I'm like trying to stop this from happening, she opens up her upstairs window and is like, and the next door neighbor lady is just like, you know, well, we need, this is our land. We need to be getting out. You know, I have a heart condition and stuff like that. And I'm like, well, you, first of all, you should calm down if you got a heart condition. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Second of all, like, I, I was like, why don't you have your, the plow guy come around to our side, push it from our side all the way through, you know, because there's more room on the other side that they could push snow to. But anyway, they were having none of that. That would require logic and reason. And some people are just too lazy to to come to that, to even come to that, because thinking is hard. So the upstairs neighbor came down with her dog and I was like, look, I'll help shovel out. I got to get out of here too in a couple of hours, but we need to talk to the landlord about this. Meanwhile, I came back in to do this podcast and because my walls are so thin, Mm -hmm. they're out there talking about it right now. She like a couple <laughs> of the residents of the building. So I can hear them while well, I could before I put my headset on. I've had it because I've been living here for a decade and this is a problem every time there's snow and there's always snow because I live in the far north. Right. Not quite Canada, but we'll get to that. Right. And meanwhile, where I'm living, the weather is really nice today. I mean, it, it, it don't get me wrong. It's chilly this morning letting the dogs out, but it's sunshiny and I'm looking at green grass. So I'm counting my blessings today because I don't like snow at all. I already had to change my socks because they're completely soaked through. So yeah. You didn't do the bread bag method? I didn't. I had to run out there because they were doing oh. it like I just had time to pull pants on, right? Yeah. And run out there and like be like, hey, hey, cut it out. How about you? What's been up with you? So- after I watched the movie last night, I started that series called Quiet on the Set about the background behind kids' television, namely Nickelodeon shows. Whoa. Oh, the yeah, dark if, side of kids' TV. Yeah, the dark side of kids' TV. And wow, I mean, some of the shows my kids watched, what went on in the background during those shows is just unreal. And I cannot believe how many pedophiles were involved in, in, in the background of those shows and people just let them do it. Oh my gosh. Oh. I have no idea. I, you know, I'll get around to watching it maybe sometime, but uh, it's on my to watch list. But right now, frankly, it's not, it's not very high on my list yeah. of things that I kind of, 
I'm like, oh, I got to watch that because I work in TV. So I've known about this kind of stuff for years. And oh, years. I'm sure. Yeah. Like in Britain, they've known about it for a long time, too. Didn't they have they had some guy that was super popular TV host that was a convicted pedophile? I think I heard something about that, but I can't remember. Seville? Is it something Seville? I think Johnny Rotten like called him a dirty old man in like the 1977 or something when they were on his show. Yeah, he was sitting there trying to tell everybody and they weren't hearing it. You know, it's always the case. I I mean, look at Corey Feldman. Look at how much crap he was given for just speaking out. I think that's a topic for another time. Let's talk about today's thing. Okay. Dracula, Pages from a Virgin's Diary, is basically Canada's Royal Winnipeg Ballet. They set Dracula to the First and Second Symphony by Mahler. That's all it is. There is audio sound effects, but there is no dialogue. So it is a ballet version of Dracula. Kind of a ballet silent film version, really. Yeah, yeah. This is a film of the ballet. We'll we'll talk about what it what it's like, but let's let's first get a background to year two thousand two. Okay, so digging into the background of two thousand two, U.S. Airways filed bankruptcy. The United States had the Winter Olympics that year in Salt Lake City. There was a FIFA World Cup where Brazil defeated Germany. George W. Bush gave his Axis of Evil speech. President Carter won the Nobel Peace Prize that year. Switzerland and East Timor join the UN. The euro becomes the official currency of 12 of the European Union's members. The European Union also voted to add 10 new countries to the EU. Kmart becomes the largest retailer in American history to file for Chapter 11 bankruptcy protection. The Queen Mother died in the UK. The No Child Left Behind Act was passed. An estimated 40 million people were now infected with the AIDS virus. Elizabeth Smart was kidnapped from her family's Salt Lake City home and found alive in 2003. The Queen Elizabeth celebrated her Golden Jubilee. We will talk more about Queen Elizabeth coming up. Oh, cool. Cool. I'm looking forward to that. So let's talk about this Royal Winnipeg Ballet that present this. Winnipeg is not the first city I think of when I think of Canada. It is, in fact, the eighth largest city in Canada. There's only about half a dozen, if that, big ballet companies in Canada. Or even small ballet companies in Canada. There's only about (laughs) half a dozen. Maybe if you count ballet schools and stuff, it might be as many as 10, you know? Right. But there's probably only like five major ones. So how did the eighth largest city in Canada get one? It turns out that Gwyneth Lloyd and Betty Farrelly, again, I'm guessing that's how you pronounce their name. I'm not sure. They founded Canada's Royal Winnipeg Ballet School. They met when Gwyneth Lloyd was running a dance school in Leeds, England. Farrelly was her student. And they both immigrated to Canada in the year 1938. And they settled in Winnipeg. They offered dance classes to the community, starting with only six students in their first year. By year two, their enrollment had grown enough that they were able to establish the Winnipeg Ballet Club. So it's still small. By 1943, the Winnipeg Ballet was formed with all its dancers coming from the club. So it was big enough to have its own ballet. Six years later, the company officially became a not-for-profit cultural institution. In 1951, the company was invited to perform for then Princess Elizabeth during her visit to Winnipeg just prior to her becoming Queen of England. So when she became Queen of England two years later in 1953, she bestowed the Winnipeg Ballet's royal designation. So that's how they became the Royal Winnipeg Ballet. Wow. 
so that's kind of a little background to who the Royal Winnipeg Ballet is. Let's just jump into talking about this film itself. When you presented this movie to the team, I wasn't sure what kind of movie this was. And I definitely wasn't expecting a ballet silent film. (laughs) And I was like, oh, man, what am I getting into? So I watched this YouTuber and I listened to what she had to say. And I was like, "Okay, this actually really does sound interesting. And so when I watched it, yeah, definitely not a B movie. Definitely, you know, a lot more highbrow than that. I've always loved dance. I haven't ever been involved in ballet and I've only seen maybe a couple and that was in school, but I loved it. I have a high respect for that because that's a very, very difficult form of dance. If you've ever seen a picture of a ballerina's feet, you know how difficult of a practice it is. So that first, you know, I I always go into that with a lot of respect. Like all ballets, it is organized into a number of acts. This is from the actual ballet program. Act one, scene one, estate in England, late 1800s. Having already been accepted into Dracula's world, Lucy collapses in her bedroom. Her nightmares and sleepwalking have the household staff concerned. Troubled by her erratic moods, Lucy's three suitors and a medical specialist, Dr. Abraham Van Helsing, are summoned to her bedside. Close to hysterical and seemingly paranoid, Lucy faints. Van Helsing determines Lucy to have unexplainable loss of blood. A transfusion is required. Suspicious that supernatural forces are at work, Van Helsing discovers two tiny holes in Lucy's neck. Research material from the mansion library is brought to the doctor. Van Helsing abandons medical remedies and surrounds Lucy's bedroom with garlic and crosses. Lucy appears dead to the doctor and three suitors. When I was watching this, I was like, well, this thing wasted no time. Less than five minutes in and already Dracula bites Lucy. Yeah, that's what I was thinking too. (laughs) Five minutes in. What I realized is much like when you go to the opera and like it's in Italian or whatever, French or something, they kind of expect that you already know the story. Right. So I think that's true of this. Speaking from a film perspective, this is most like Nosferatu 1922. It's like a silent movie. It's in black and white. It even has parts of it tinted the way that Nosferatu was tinted. Talked about that when we talked about Nosferatu 1922. If you haven't listened to that, go back and listen to that program. It will help inform what we talk about in this one. Also, remember when you did the like 42 clove garlic stew or whatever it was, soup, whatever <laughs> yeah. it was? Yeah. That's what that the, reminded me of when they did the garlic in this because there was garlic everywhere it's like most of these they put like a little wreath of garlic around their neck and they're done this there was just like mountains of garlic (laughs) oh yeah garlic for days absolute days they definitely had that stew when they when, when, when they were doing all that they had enough garlic to do it because this is ballet and it's more visual they concentrated on different things from what we normally see they can't relate things via dialogue and they can't relate things in other ways. They have to relate things via dance. So it's more visual. We got to see the dancing devils of Mrs. Westenra's nightmare. We know that she had nightmares, but even in the book, they just say that it was plagued by nightmares or whatever. But in this, they have a whole dance sequence of devils and things like that in her dreams. And she eventually ends up letting Dracula in. They definitely jumped right into it. And for me, it was kind of hard to determine the difference between the nightmare sweet sequences and, and the actual storyline, to be honest with you. It was a little bit confusing to me, but I enjoyed it. It was very visually appealing. And I felt like the dancers got the message across. They did tell the story very well. I like how they presented the story and and I do like how they presented the beginning, even though it was a little quick for me. The second scene is in Lucy's crypt. 
again, quoting from the actual ballet program, holding her under his dark spell, Dracula claims his prize by initiating Lucy into the tomb. Van Helsing and the suitors, suspicious of Lucy's death, break into the tomb. Armed with crosses and stakes, they manage to free Lucy from Dracula's evil empire. Lucy and Dracula's waltz in the graveyard in the snow was one of the most beautiful parts of this. The steady cam work with the confrontation with vampire Lucy is outstanding. The staking and decapitation of her in this was probably better than any other version, except maybe Bram Stoker's Dracula, the Coppola film. But I'd say this might even have the edge over that. It was beautifully done, you know, very well translated through dance. They obviously couldn't do a whole lot of blood, guts, and gore on stage. Being on stage kind of limits that, so they have to kind of work around that. And if anything, I kind of welcomed it this time. Act two, scene one, they call it the red dance. This bacchanal is inspired by the traditions of classical dance along with elements of folklore and folk dance. The wolf and dancers reflect different aspects of Dracula and his world. Now, I don't remember the wolf, but that was scene one of the red dance. Mm -hmm. Scene two of the red dance, according to the program, quote, Mina Murray, a friend of Lucy Wistenra, who is unaware of the fate which has befallen her, travels to a convent in Budapest after being summoned to the side of her ill fiance, Jonathan Harker. In order to advance his career, Jonathan has recently traveled to Transylvania to assist Count Dracula in buying real estate in England. Mina and Jonathan are together after a long absence when she chances upon his diary. Mina reads that Dracula had abandoned Jonathan in the castle where he encountered three vampire women. Though lured by their strange seduction, Jonathan has managed to escape. Mina is enticed by Jonathan's experiences in the castle, and part of her feels drawn to that world. Having no secrets from Jonathan, she divulges this desire. Jonathan is shocked by Mina's behavior, which is similar to that of the vampire women. Repressing these desires, Mina assures Jonathan of her love by sealing the diary's secrets. They spend Act 2 flashing back to all the stuff that happened earlier. Mm Mm-hmm. And boy, is it quick. So in this one, Harker's visit to Transylvania is told in flashback, but super fast cutting through it so fast that if you didn't already know the story, you'd probably be lost. And I also noticed that they have words like flesh pots. Yeah. (laughs) Flash on the screen. Yeah. The dance of the nuns seemed a little unnecessary. I don't know why they threw that in. Yeah. Yeah. At one point, Mina, she tries to give him a BJ. There's no other way of putting it. Um, yeah. <laughs> and he stops her. What was this about? I guess that like she had vampiric urges too. I don't know. Or like that all sex is bad. I don't know. Yeah. Well, in the description, it said that she reminded him of the vampire women. So maybe he was still dealing with a little PTSD and was like, no, 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 no. You can't go down there. Yeah. No. Yeah. We're not doing that yet. You got to put a ring on it. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, could be. Then Dracula ends up tempting her with money. That was something that I don't remember from any other version of this, but I guess kind of... It's implied in some of the others, especially like Bram Stoker's Dracula, because he's like this wealthy count who woos her, you know. But in this, they just like openly like show it. He opens a big chest of money and they they're throwing bills in the air and stuff like that. Meanwhile, at the castle, the others basically Seward and Morris and Holmwood and Van Helsing they're basically killing off the brides. And, you know, they have like Cuckold's counter blow where he like kills one of the brides, I guess, in reprisal for killing his fiance Lucy or whatever. I don't know. Yeah, it's payback. <laughs> Since the flashback to when Harker would have been at Dracula's castle happens in the second act, Between the second and third act, 
which is probably traditionally the intermission time anyway, this is when there would have been the scene where Dracula served Harker wine and Harker would ask him, how about you? And Dracula would say, I never drink wine. wine. Yep. <laughs> so I think it is time for this segment. I never drink wine. In this segment, I, someone who knows nothing about wine, tries to tell you what I think should be paired with this movie. And you probably will not listen to me. But here we go anyway. <laughs> it is traditional at the ballet to sip champagne. So I went with champagne for this. I chose Corbel Brut, which is basically the only champagne that I could find that comes in like the mini bottles. It's like about six ounces. Pinky's out. <laughs> That's fancy. Because <laughs> I wasn't going to open a big bottle of champagne and drink an entire bottle of champagne watching this. One, I don't like champagne that much. And two, there's no way I would have never made it to the end of the film if I drank an entire bottle of that. Corbel Brut claims to be, according to their website, America's favorite California champagne. Corbel, I assume I'm saying it right. Corbel Brut is refined with a balanced, medium dry finish. Enjoy lively aromas of citrus and cinnamon, leading to crisp flavors of orange, lime, vanilla, and a hint of strawberry. And tastes like any of those to me, but whatever. <laughs> they say, enjoy with caviar, which I didn't, fried foods, which I didn't, salty snacks, which I didn't, and shellfish, which I didn't. <laughs> A little bit about champagne real quick. Brut refers to how sweet it is. Okay. It's basically French. I don't know what it is in French, what it translates to, but they couldn't just put dry on the bottle. I think it means dry. They couldn't put that on the bottle because everything has to be in French. It's just like the ballet, no matter where in the world it is, Japan, Timbuktu, Kenya, wherever it is, all the ballet steps are still in French because ballet is pretentious that way. Well, so is champagne, which, by the way, I think can only be called champagne if it's from the champagne region of France, because, again, they're, you know, pretentious that way, except if it's like Corbel, which is American and we don't give a crap. So we just call it champagne because we're we're America, damn it. Yeah. Uh, the translation of brute is raw, raw, R-A-W. Yep. R-A-W. Yep. Okay. Raw. So if you want to raw dog your champagne, <laughs> you want Corbel Brut. <laughs> so basically, there's six different or seven different sweetness uh, levels. The sweetest is, I think, called dough. And it has like 50 plus grams of sugar. They add extra sugar to these things so that it becomes sweeter. And also this it helps make those bubbles. Makes sense. Then with about 32 to 50 grams of sugar, there's demi-sec. And then dry, which has between 17 to 32 grams of sugar. Extra dry, which has 12 to 17 grams of sugar. Then comes brute with 0 to 12 grams of sugar. There's also an extra brute, which has 0 to 6 grams of sugar. And then brute nature, which contains only 0 to 3 grams of sugar. Hmm. Those are the sweetness scales. I don't know too much about that, but what I do know is that champagne is generally consumed in one of three different kinds of glasses. A champagne flute, that's the long, tall glass, and the advantage to that seems to be that it has less surface area, so it stays carbonated longer. It doesn't mm -hmm. go flat as fast. But its drawback is that supposedly you can't smell the aroma as much of course an advantage to that is you have less bubbles going up your nose because it's got that small narrow opening true then there is the tulip glass named because it's shaped like a tulip blossom mm -hmm. so it's kind of like a white wine glass although slightly more angular and so that's considered to be you know the one that a lot of champagne aficionados 
go with because it's still narrow enough that it reduces the surface area at the top and it doesn't go flat as fast. I did not drink it from either of those. I went with what's called a coupe. Now, the champagne coupe is that small, you know, sort of broad saucer shaped oh, okay. stem glass. Mm -hmm. It was fashionable in France. You hear a lot of like bogus claims that it was based on the shape of Marie Antoinette's breast, which it <laughs> totally wasn't because it was invented in England like a century earlier. But I think that you can get modern ones that are molded off of Kate Moss's breasts. <laughs> wow. All right, then. It has the advantage that it's smaller so you and wider, so you really get the aroma, but it goes flat faster. But they're so shallow that even with this tiny six ounces of Corbel, it only took like three fill-ups to finish off the little model. Okay. Uh, Corbel Brut is kind of like the Budweiser of champagne. Like it's a mass market American <laughs> champagne that you find at weddings and celebrations everywhere. I'm sure you've seen it. Oh, yeah. I've had some of it to drink over the years, too, because my partner, he's a bartender. So more often than not, we end up bringing the New Year in at the bar that he works at because he's working. And sometimes I'll work it with him. But inevitably, we end up with a bottle of the champagne <laughs> somehow. <laughs> and I'm pretty sure that was the kind we had. <laughs> yeah, it's the one you see everywhere, especially on New Year's Eve. Oh, yeah. That doesn't mean it's bad because wine enthusiast said that it is effusive fruit bowl aromas and flavors are buoyed by lively effervescence in this medium bodied accessible wine. A touch of sweetness rounds the edges of the texture. So that was in, from Wine Enthusiast in May of 2020. That tracks. <laughs> yeah. Here's the tasting notes they have on their website. The appellation is California. Fermentation, 100% stainless steel. I guess that's a thing. Composition, Chardonnay, Chenin Blanc, French Colombar and Pinot Noir. So I guess it's a blend of those. Acid is 7.6 grams per liter. pH is 3.20. Alcohol is 12%. Dosage, whatever that means, is 1%. Their winemaking notes are, all Corbel California champagnes are made using the traditional method, me, method champagnois, Mm -hmm. Bottle fermentation process. Sorry, French people. The meth méthode champagnois, if I'm saying it right, process actually begins in the vineyard. We harvest the grapes for Corbel Brut about two weeks earlier than is typical for still wines. The early harvest promotes the delicate, crisp, bright flavors of this varietal. So it apparently won the San Diego International Wine and Spirit Challenge. It won the gold in 2023. It's won a bunch of other competitions. So apparently it's still considered a pretty good champagne. But I wouldn't know. I drank it. It was fine. The fact that I watched this in the like late morning, early afternoon made it kind of appropriate for what I was going for. Nice. Day drinking. I'm here for it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's our intermission between act two and act three, or at least act two, scene one and two and scene three. Scene three of act two is the crypt at Dracula's castle in Transylvania, late 1800s. According to the program, quote, Mina has been taken captive by Dracula, who offers her a place to live in the world of the living dead the place she read about in Jonathan's diary. Dracula leaves Mina drained of blood as he hears Van Helsing and Lucy's suitors inside the castle. Finding Mina alive, they hunt for Dracula. The daylight is fast approaching and Dracula is forced to battle the men. With all enslaved, the Count tortures Jonathan by performing his blood ritual on Mina. Witnessing Jonathan's anguish, Mina manages to weaken Dracula by draining him of his blood. Mina then seizes a cross and wakens the dazed men. They surround Dracula and, like Vlad of Wallachia, kill him. All right. In this one, when Mina asks, 
will you drive a stake through my heart and cut off my head, which they have as an interspersed text title. Van mm-hmm. Helsing says what I said, you should have said in Bram Stoker's Dracula. Yes, my child, I shall. Like in <laughs> Bram Stoker's Dracula, when she asked that, Harker's just like, let him go. And he lets Mina and Dracula go off into the church together. And this is just like, yeah, we're going to stake you and cut off your head. Yeah. (laughs) So the ending, Dracula basically, it looks like he kills Van Helsing and flees, then comes back to tempt Harker. This wouldn't be ballet if it wasn't a little gay. So there's a dance between (laughs) (laughs) Harker and Dracula that is definitely pretty gay. And I say that in the most loving way, but yeah, it's it's pretty gay. (laughs) He kills Harker and dances with Mina then. And then the scene where he cuts open his shirt and Mina drinks his blood happens at the end. Mina grabs a cross and turns it on him and they all come to their senses and they impale him. And this is the only time I've seen the wooden stake not be like a handheld stake, but be a full blown pike and they impale him the same way Vlad Tepish is supposed to be, you know, Vlad the Impaler. Mm -hmm. That comes straight out of the history books. So that was kind of interesting. I feel like this final scene was influenced by Bram Stoker's Dracula from 92, starring Winona Ryder, Keanu Reeves, and of course, all roads lead to Gary Oldman. Everyone! And, And the reason why I say that is, you know, one... Mina looks a lot like Winona Ryder. There was no getting around that to me. Yeah, she does. She did. She did. Yeah. Me, Cindy, Cindy Mar- Marie Small. That's Cindy it Marie was. Small. Yeah. Cindy Marie Small. And she looks a lot like Winona Ryder in this. Mm-hmm. And then on top of that, you know, I don't know if this was in the book. Again, I still haven't read it. I, I'm a horrible, I'm horrible when it comes to reading books, but I noticed that, you know, again, Dracula opens his shirt, scratches across his chest so that Mina can drink his blood, just like in Bram Stoker's Dracula. And, you know, again, it was, you know, a super sexy scene, just like in the movie. So was that influenced by the movie or was it influenced by the book? Uh, That is in the book where he, he takes his nail and he cuts his breast and he basically grabs her head and forces her to drink his blood in the book. And we talked about this before. It's more like he grabs her head and starts pushing her downward. Mm -hmm. And so this may be a metaphor for something else. Probably. And then of course the Harker and everybody busts in while she's in the act of doing that with him. That kind (laughs) of, that kind of (laughs) happens. Yeah, but there's also like he says something about like, you know, I'm taking your woman, you know, blah, 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 you know. So there's always been a part of this where I'm kind of like, you know, how willing is she? Because it's she seems pretty eager to do this. Right. You know? In this, they they flip it the script a little bit and make it like she's drinks his blood to sort of drain him of his strength so that the others have a chance to like recover and come after him you know which works with that same metaphor too if you think about it you know well the um the the influencer that i found i don't like the word influencer the host whatever um youtuber the youtuber thank you the youtuber that i found her name is maven of the eventide her theory was kind of like you know blood was a metaphor for another bodily fluid Right. That only comes from men. Oh, yeah. I know this. I know this YouTuber. We'll, we'll, yeah. throw, a, we'll throw a shout out to Maven of the Eventide. I think her thing is just vampires, if I'm right. She only does mm-hmm. vampire stuff. Like, all yeah. of her videos are about vampires. Yes. Yeah. Very dramatic. I mean, she really reminds me of somebody that I would have met um, that went to, like, the Rocky Horror Picture Show or something. That she yeah, totally yeah, would have hung around in She has circle. been, she has totally played Magenta in Rocky Horror somewhere. Oh, had so, to. Uh, like, you know. It, she had some very interesting theories about this film. One thing I uh, wanted to mention to you, um, that 
uh, Maven had stated, and this was an observation that she made, is that the virgin wasn't necessarily Lucy. It was Jonathan Harker. Ah. Ah. Uh, interesting insight. So, yeah, so maybe the whole BJ thing was traumatic for him. You know, there right. might have been some trauma there going on. That puts things in a whole different light. Yeah, he's the only one that had a diary in this thing. Right. And and could you imagine being a virgin and then being trapped in a room with three female vampires that are completely taking advantage of you? At, so it's so rapey. <laughs> it's so rapey. So it's no wonder that when Mina came up to him and, and was very forward with him, um, that he's like, whoa, babe, <laughs> back off. <They're, laughs> yeah, I mean, they're not just, they're like hungry, right? They're like, so yeah. they're starved, right? In in the, literally he brings, Dracula brings them, him a baby for them to feast on. Right. Uh, which we've talked about a bunch of times. But I think if we're talking about this being a metaphor, that means there's three, not one, not two, but three sex starved women locked in a room with virgin Jonathan, you know, or... <laughs> Or like, you know, what did you call Keanu? A snack? You know? Yeah, he's definitely <laughs> like, a snack. He, he was literally a snack. <laughs> Jonathan Harker, literally a snack. <laughs> wow, that's... that blo Okay, mind blown. I hadn't even thought about that part, but yeah. Okay, so this is why we, we recommend that you guys go to other podcasts and watch and listen to them as well as ours because there's definitely a world of interpretation out there for some of these things. It is kind of a long watch. The video that she has about it is about a half hour long. But if you want to do a deep dive into what she has to say about it, she does definitely have some interesting things to say. So it's called Vampire Reviews, Dracula Pages from a Virgin's Diary. Really gave me a lot of foresight into the film before I started watching it. Yeah, she just kept saying that blood was a metaphor. <laughs> I haven't watched her stuff in a long time, but... Thanks for bringing her back to all of our attention. And Oh, yeah, definitely. We're really lazy about posting transcripts and links and stuff like that. But if we ever get the chance on YouTube, I'll link to her video on this so that you guys can watch it, too, because I'm sure she does a much deeper dive than we're prepared to do in the time we have. Oh, yeah, much deeper. It's definitely worth a watch. If this is what you're into, take the time to watch her episode on this. I mean, for me, it's more like, I need to drink something. All right, champagne. And I <laughs> pick up like Corbell and I'm like, hmm, founded in 1892. That was the year that Bella Lugosi was born. Okay, this is the this is the champagne we're having. It you was know, meant it, to be. <laughs> that, that's like the kind of like thought that goes into this this podcast. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. And I, you know, uh, you you taught me something new today. I had no idea that champagne was was traditionally what you drank at the ballet, but I mean, it, it makes sense. And here I had two bottles in my fridge. I, I could have drank that instead of the, you know, Moscato that I had. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it's fine. It's fine. How do you rank this compared to the other Draculas we've watched? I would say it would be closer to the top because it's it's a different take on it. You know, it almost deserves its own category because it is a ballet. It's not a typical film. And it is an art film. I mean, you know, the director did art films before. And then he took on this project because he was broke. It almost gets its own category because there aren't that many ballet art films out there. <laughs> so, not that I know of, unless you know something I don't know, Eric. <laughs> I... I liked it. It was, I felt a little classy after watching it because, you know, it was the ballet. Um, I don't get to do that very much, so. Dracula, pages from a virgin's diary. The Royal Winnipeg Ballet Company doing a version of Dracula set to Mahler's first and second symphonies. I don't think we'll be doing another ballet anytime soon. Uh, so enjoy it. All, all the classy bitches that listen to our show. <laughs> That's right. Pinkies <laughs> out bitches. <laughs> um, yeah, we'll be back with more Dracula as we try to bring us up to date in the 2020s. I want to remind you to like and subscribe 
download our podcast wherever you get your podcasts. Also, I think we're finally like regularly releasing on YouTube. Every few months, YouTube blocks us for some reason. And then like I have to like reapply and then they they start doing it again. So I don't know if you'd want to listen to a podcast on what is essentially a video platform, but a lot of you seem to. So we're there as well. But you can get us at Apple, Google, Amazon, Pandora, Spotify, you name it. You could probably find us there. Pretty much available on all platforms. This is the year where we're asking you to tell two people about the podcast. So in the entire year of 2024, just recommend our podcast to two other people. That's all we ask. We're already a quarter of the way through 2024, as hard as it is to believe. So, you know, if you haven't recommended us to at least one person yet this year, it's time to do that. It really helps out the show. If you want to communicate with us, you can write to us at GC8 Podcast. That's letter G, letter C, number eight, podcast at gmail.com. Until next time, this is Eric. This is Rosie. Signing off. And you probably will not listen to me, but here we go anyway.